I know if you've never met him, you'd probably still be alive. That's true. Yeah, that's because you killed him. No. Oh, I'm gonna have my photo taken and I haven't done any makeup. I freaking smiled <laughs> and tilted my head and everything. I know, how dumb. Dude, what does the internet say? It's got your picture on the internet. Um, does it have my pretty smile? Yes, it has your pretty face on there. I was in the front page yesterday, top of the fold. I'm famous. I'm infamous. I didn't hear you breathe. I wonder how am I still here. Well, take care of my kitty. She might outlive you guys. I am a freaking weird dog. Travis Alexander and Jody Arias seemed to be a match made in heaven. The two first met at a Las Vegas business convention in September of 2006, and immediately they found themselves in the throes of a passionate and intense attraction. Yet less than two years after their romance began, it became clear that Travis and Jody were actually a match made in hell. Travis's life met a horribly brutal end. As his death was investigated, the facade around his life was stripped away, and the darkest, most disturbing secrets were brought to light. How could a once perfect relationship end in so much blood and tragedy? It actually all started with Travis's childhood, long before he and Jody ever met. Travis was born in Riverside, California in July of 1977. According to his blog, which he characterized as random thoughts, excerpts from a book he was writing, and being stupid, his beginning was humble. In actuality, early life for Travis and siblings can only be described as hellacious, evidenced by excerpts from Travis's blog. However, it's important to note that these statements are clearly allegations and unconfirmed claims. My childhood, unfortunately, was very much like any child's that had drug-addicted parents. My father was never around, which left my siblings and I to the fate given by my mother, a good woman with the intent at an early age to be a loving mom. A few poor decisions changed that. As she progressively got more involved in drugs, she progressively got less capable of raising children. According to Travis's blog, he and his sisters allegedly suffered frequent beatings at the hands of his mother. You see, when you're high on meth for a week, when you eventually come down, there is a lot of sleep to catch up on. When you sleep for four days with a house full of kids, there isn't any food cooked. We would eat what was there, but before long, what was edible would be eaten or rot, and then what was rotten would be eaten too. School wasn't much better. When your clothes are as dirty as the rest of you and you stink and have lice, you don't make a ton of friends. Sadly, as you could imagine, I was mocked for my appearance. Chris and Sky Hughes, close friends of Travis, knew how Travis struggled through school, but they also knew how he was able to build himself to a better life. The following footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor, a licensed attorney, and a former detective, former licensed polygraph examiner, and former hostage negotiation commander and instructor. Well, all through high school, he was total dork. I mean, ate lunch alone in the cafeteria, or no, in the library. Yeah, Had overweight. no friends. Yeah, overweight, big thighs, big butt. And the kids would follow him from behind and go, up, down, up, down, up, down. What they're doing is talking about his, his pants would disappear into his butt crack, <laughs> you know, and his, he, he was poor, so he couldn't afford nice clothes. And yeah. so I understand Travis, at least I think I do, a, a lot when it comes to women because he was this total dork until he got in the business. And then he got this measure of success. And there's like, it's, it's, it's almost like a little world prepaid legal. Yeah. You know, like when we go to conventions, you, people ask for your autograph and stuff. Oh, you know, yeah, if you're making over 100000 or 200000 or whatever. So you're in this book, you know, and, and Travis was in the book. Um, and so he had reached like this pseudo celebrity status in the business, even though he wasn't making that much money. You know, his best he year was. was like, but he, I mean, he was making eighty. Yeah. is like previously. Although Travis seemed to have newfound success in his working life, his private life was nothing short of tumultuous, and it was no coincidence that this turmoil began shortly after Jody had made her entrance. Jody was born in Salinas, California in July of 1980 to William and Sandra Arias. In stark contrast to Travis, Jody's upbringing was calm and steady. Her and her four siblings never wanted for food or the care of her parents, 
and it seemed as though Jody was living a wondrously happy life. However, according to her father, things with Jody were not all sunshine and rainbows. She doesn't trust us because we're parents. When she was in eighth grade, she got busted for growing marijuana with our Tupperware, putting it on top of the roof. We found it, they called the sheriff department. And then they busted her, and then, I don't know, some of her friends or something. And then we searched her room. That was the first time we've ever searched her room. And after that, she was so, she was kind of like, uh, something turned in her head that we were nosy parents and we we're gonna, we we're gonna search everything she had. So she hid everything from us and always has since then. Jody's life seemed to almost spiral after this event. During a rebellious teen phase, Jody dropped out of high school and began pursuing a career in photography that inevitably failed. She then found herself tangled in a mess of dead-end jobs and deadbeat boyfriends. According to Jody's mother, one of these boyfriends took a particular toll on Jody's life. She's really in debt. She, she bought a house with her other boyfriend and... Lost the house? And, uh, yeah, and he moved in, in Palm Desert and he moved back to Monterey and she stayed there and their house payments were like 3500 and she maxed out her credit cards trying to pay her part of it. I mean, thousands of dollars because she always thought that she could just dig her way out. And then her car, she didn't make her car payments for months and months and months. And yes. With her crushing debt and seemingly no plan for the future, Jody turned to prepaid legal, hopeful that it could bring her the success she desperately needed. While she may not have found the monetary boom she was looking for, she did find Travis. Travis was known for his charisma and magnetic personality, and after seeing him perform as his character Eddie Snell from Alabama, it's easy to understand why Jody would be taken with him. All right. <laughs> Are we ready to start the revolution? <laughs> Despite Jody's issues, Travis immediately fell hard for her. In an email from Travis to Sky, he described his intense feelings for Jody despite being so early in their relationship. After just a few short months, Jody and Travis were in a fully-fledged, long-distance relationship. I went from intrigued by her, to interested in her, to caring about her deeply, to realizing how lucky I would be to have her as part of my life forever. She is amazing. It is not hard to see that whoever scores Jody, whether it be me or someone else, is going to win the wife lotto. Although Travis may have claimed to be so in love with Jody, his behavior towards her in public contradicted this. So when they first started dating, when he, I had seen him be affectionate to her one time ever in public. At our house, yes, but in public, never. She was always around him. If people asked, he was like, no, she follows me around. You know, she won't leave me alone. But I mean, I'm sure there's like... Is that like, from the beginning? I mean, from when yeah. they had Las and we, Vegas? W when they first, yeah, when they, well, when they first started hanging out, you know, he'd talk, he'd be seen with her and... You know, yeah, she's hot, you know, this is my chick, you know, but it was never like, I'm committing to you and only to you, ever. And the first month, we actually got in a fight with Trump, I'm sure you read it, about how he treated her. And we're like, you know, if you didn't treat her better or quit hooking up with her, you know, because we thought she was, you know, really cool, a little weird, but very cool. Despite his inconsistent behavior, Travis did seem to be interested in pursuing a future with Jody. However, there was one small issue per one of his blog posts. I've learned a lot about what matters most to me in finding a wife. There are many qualities, of course, that are an absolute must. Spirituality, mutual physical attraction, the ability to communicate effectively, wants children, etc. But there's one thing that I have come to appreciate as much more than all the others. I don't know how to label this quality except to say that it's the quality to appreciate the qualities in me. While everything about Jody may have seemed perfect to Travis, she didn't share his Mormon faith, something that was a deal breaker for him. Not wanting to lose this relationship, Jody was baptized into the church by Travis. Although she may have seemed overjoyed with her newfound religion, Chris and Skye had an interesting take on the situation. You know, my opinion of her, she's, and I, I've seen her in action with several different groups of people, she's a total chameleon. While social chameleon isn't a true psychological term, Research suggests that the psychology of social chameleons can be rooted in factors such as low self-esteem, a lack of clear self-identity, and a heightened need for external validation. 
These individuals may have a tendency to prioritize external cues and feedback over their internal sense of self-worth. As a result, their behavior can become inconsistent and difficult to predict as they shift their actions and attitudes based on the expectations and preferences of the people around them. This may have more of an anxious attachment style and fear of being alone or rejected more than others. And she's good. I mean, she she's... would like, I mean, we have two, we had two boys at the time, a dog. Travis was there. We're loud laughing and everything. And she would like bring her scriptures out and sit on the couch. Like the TV's on, the kids are running around crazy. And she'd like read in front of us. Like, just all in that. It's really funny. Because she thought that's what Travis wanted. Then when he spurns her, then that's when the sexuality started. Because she's like, well, he doesn't like the Molly Mormon chick, so I'm going to give him something yeah. else he might like. Which he liked, but he wouldn't commit to her yeah. because he, he still knew she was nutty. And I'm sure he told her he loved her and, you know, I'm Whatever he had to tell her. and let's be together. But there was a point that, you know, I, I said, if you, I will, if you want to marry her, marry her. I'm like, if you feel like that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. And he's like, oh, no, I don't want to marry her. Make like, a decision. Yeah, he's like, I know that for sure. But that was one of Travis's problems is he could never cut it off with anyone. I mean, Deanna was, a, what, 10 years ago? And she's still in his life. I mean, up until the very end, he just could not set anybody loose. Because he was afraid to be alone. Yeah. Travis and Jody were still inextricably drawn to each other, regardless of Travis's supposed reservations. Jody, on the other hand, was desperate to keep Travis in her life. Like she Would was not. driving him crazy, but at the same time, it was like he was addicted to her. You know, like yes, he had very up and down, and his downs were very down. And he would always like say, "I wanted to blow my head off." You know? Did he text this? That he texted this. Yeah, I, that was like a month I before, right? My life. Yeah. While Travis's behavior and opinion of Jody seemed to be erratic, Jody was just as bad, and there was quite a bit going on behind her sweet facade. I I could see a little manic in her. I mean, she was... Oh, yeah, well, like, when, with her issues with Travis, like, yeah. she would, like, obsess on him, you know, and be, like, call me bawling and super upset. Or, like, when she's at my house, she'd start crying about, you know, Travis this, Travis that. It didn't take long before Chris and Skye severed ties with Jody. They began to fear for the safety of their family after an interaction with her that took an eerie turn. It was late one night at the Hughes home where Jody and Travis were staying as they often would on the weekends. The home had become a point where the two could meet between their respective homes, seeing as how their relationship was one of long distance. Travis, Skye, and Chris were in the middle of a private discussion that centered around the issues Travis and Jody had been having. Well, Skye Sky just says, that's on her door, and Travis like, no way. And I'm just watching Sky because she's pretty smart that way. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> and we all get like chills, you know what I mean? And then Travis walks over there real quiet and jerks the door open. And she's like right there. Wow. And, and when we see this crazy look, and it gets worse. She says, um, are you coming to bed? He's like, yeah, I'll be home later. <laughs> and she goes, when? And he goes, later. We're talking. And she's like. She goes, okay. She just turns around. She goes back downstairs. We'll probably talk him for another hour. And Travis goes and opens the door. And she's like, what's going no, on? The look on her face. Like, we were like, oh, it my It put gosh. the fear of God in, into us. To, to the extent that, you know, Travis and her had this little, she's like, what's going on? Is this a private conversation? He's like, yeah, it is. And she's like, well, okay, well, I'm going to go to bed. And so she goes back down. We wrapped up our conversation. Then Travis goes downstairs to do whatever he's going to do with her. But Sky and I, this is how scared we were. We're laying in bed talking about that face that we saw. And she said, are we safe? I said, are kids safe? I don't know. And then she said, should we have more kids and have them sleep in our bedroom tonight? Really? Yeah. Felt that compelled. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like chills. Was, like, like chills. Scary. Like, when she looked at us, it was like this. I mean, I get chills right now. I mean, it, it was, I've never seen anything like it. It's interesting that Chris and Sky seemed to have a very strong sense that Jody was dangerous. This was before Jody had demonstrated any overtly aggressive behaviors, but still, Chris and Sky were convinced that Jody was capable of harm. This sense, also known as a gut feeling or intuition, is believed to be an evolutionary instinct passed down to us by our ancestors. 
Another way to explain how Chris and Skye seem to just know that Jody was dangerous is because of certain brain processes that warn us of impending danger. The amygdala, which is the part of the brain that processes emotions, can react to certain situations in our environment even before the conscious mind really understands it fully. This can result in an immediate discomfort or outright fear in a given situation. As the next day was like four hours, Jody, instead of getting up and leaving because... Well, we, we talked and, and the whole time she's just total straight face. She's like, I don't trust you. I don't want you around my family. I don't want you around my husband. And she's just like, okay. you know, but then she says... Are you going to tell Travis not to date me? And I said, yes. It was at that point that Jody finally began to show emotion despite the fact that she'd been seemingly unaffected by the other aspects of the conversation. Is that when Skye said, yeah, I'm going to tell Travis that, she just loses it. She starts crying. From there, it was only a matter of time before it all came crashing down. Jody and Travis officially broke up in June of 2007. Strangely enough, following their breakup, Jody moved from her home in Palm Desert, California, to Travis's city of Mesa, Arizona. Jody and Travis continued to interact with each other. However, they slowly grew more and more volatile towards one another until Jody eventually moved back to her family in April of 2008. Everything seemed to be turning out for the better until June of that same year, when Jody went for a trip to Utah and lost contact with her friends. One such friend even contacted Travis, hoping that he could provide details of Jody's unknown whereabouts. I know that you and Jody still talk a lot and everything, and she was headed to Utah. I didn't try to call her. I can't get a hold of her, but she was supposed to be here earlier today and was going to come to training tonight and never showed up. So a little bit worried. If you know anything, give me a call. To the relief of her friends, Jody soon surfaced. She then placed a call to Travis, hoping to quell any fears Leslie's voicemail may have caused. When he again didn't answer, she left him a detailed voicemail. Hey, what's going on? It's almost midnight. Anyway, I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. And what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits, so fun, fun. Um, also, when we were talking about your upcoming travels, um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to co accompany us. Uh, let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Jody seems to go into extreme detail in her message, going into a fairly long story, almost as if she's making sure to account for all of her time, like one would when creating an alibi. Unfortunately, Travis remained unreachable, and voicemail soon filled his mailbox. Travis, it's about 5 o'clock on Thursday. I really need to get in touch with you, bro. Call me back as soon as you can. Bye. Next message. Hey, I just want to know you're alive. Um, called you several times and you're not calling me back. So, anyways, um, uh, yeah, call me. Even if you're in the spirit world, um, I expect a phone call or a text or something. Okay, bye. Hey, Travis, I haven't talked to you in a few days, and honestly, I'm really worried about you. So... If you could give me a call back when you get this and at least let me know that you're okay, I would appreciate it. I hope everything is okay. Talk to you soon, hopefully. Bye. Travis, Chris, want to know if you want to go on the Mormon tour of Chichen Itza? So I need to know, like, ASAP, so call me as soon as you get this. I'll send you a text, and please don't text me back. Hey, email me, man. I said I left you a couple messages on your home line. I've been trying to get a hold of you for days and days and days. The longer Travis was unreachable, the more worried his friends grew. Tragically, however, it wouldn't be long before they found out the awful truth behind his silence. What's going on? Um, a friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We, we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. His roommate just went in there and, and said there's lots of blood. I didn't go in, but I, I can give you the phone to someone who went in there. Can, yes, please, can you? Hello. Hi, so what's going on? He's, uh, he, he's dead. He's in his bedroom okay. in, in the shower. How many people are in the house? Just the five of us? Five of us. Okay, I need all of you outside. Okay. Now, I need, I need to let the officers know what they're walking into, so okay. can you tell me where the blood is coming from? I, I don't know. I, I did. He's curled up in the shower. 
And I, that's all I saw. I, I, I turned away. What is his name? Travis. Travis what? Alexander. When officers arrived at the scene on June 9th, 2008, nothing could have prepared them for the bloodbath in Travis's house. It quickly became clear that something horrible had happened to Travis, and those that found him were brought in for interrogation. Marie Mimi Hall, a young woman Travis had briefly dated, was the first to realize something was wrong. I was going to be alone tonight, and Travis and I were going to go to camping tomorrow. What time was that going to be today? We were going to leave at 9.25, the flight, and I think we were supposed to get to Cancun at 6 or 7 o'clock. Like, you know, I didn't see him at church on Sunday, and I hadn't heard from him at all, and so I called a couple times tonight, and didn't hear back, and so it's just really weird. I went over once before everybody else was there. Mm -hmm. I was like scared too. Like I was thinking the worst. Like mm -hmm. I heard about his friend who stalked him and slashed tires and ripped his car and stuff. So I was just, I had, was just scared. Like maybe she would have done something. Or and so I went over there, but I had my mom on the phone mm -hmm. just in case something really weird was happening. And so. Um, rang the doorbell a couple of times, three or four times, and and I didn't see the dog the first couple of times, so I was thinking, he must be out of town, but then all of a sudden the dog ran toward the door. So then I was really scared, and so my mom's like, call people that know him, you know, that mm -hmm. are really close to him. So that's when I called Michelle. Michelle was with her boyfriend, Dolan, at the time of Mimi's call. Michelle got a phone call from Mimi while we were driving back. I'm pretty sure the clock in the car said something like that. 49.45. Okay. And uh, Mimi was on the phone. She asked, you know, if Michelle had heard from Travis uh, recently. And Michelle said, no, you know, it's been, I don't know. You know, Mimi was saying, you know, we're supposed to leave for Cancun tomorrow, and I haven't heard from him. And so Michelle and I are driving out there, and Michelle says, you know, this isn't like Travis. I mean, that was, so that was the main reason to go out to his house last night. You know, yeah, we haven't heard from him recently, but... I need to hear from him because of this. Well, right? we went out there to, you know, to make sure you know, yeah. when you find, you hear that Travis, who I'm told is a very organized and loves planning, and he'll make sure that like, if something's going on, then the people, is going on the people the that are involved, you know, he'll keep them updated. Like, you know, three days in advance, he'll be like, hey, don't forget, you know, be ready at this time. And so Michelle was saying, you know, this, this really isn't like him. When Michelle and Dolan met up with Mimi at Travis's house, they noticed that there were lights on inside yet no one was answering the door. Meanwhile, they had gotten back on the phone with, uh, okay. it was, you know, the good friend with, uh, with Travis, and I guess had the, the code to the, the garage right. door. Okay. Yeah, he was the one that asked if, you know, Michelle would go over to the house and just, you know, see what was going on, you know, if she wanted to. Mm -hmm. and Michelle said, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll stop by. And so, says, all right, well, you know, let me give you the code and you just, you know, just go in and just, you know, see what's going on. Meantime, you know, they're opening the garage and you know, the garage opens and there are two cars in the, in the garage. Do you remember what cars those were? Uh, I know the one was Travis's car and then there's another car that I don't. Would you be able to describe them at all? Do you remember them? Travis's car is a Prius 2004. He just, I mean, it's got, I remember numbers and stuff. And he had like a new plate or not, not a new plate, but a, um, like a temporary registration, temporary like he had just gotten it. Okay. It was well known that was Travis's car. And we go in, or you know, someone. So there's a, there's a door into the in the house from the garage, right. then. Right. Okay. Was it unlocked? Or whatever. It was unlocked. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we walk in there, you know, walk through. What room does that lead into? Um, I, I want to say laundry room. Uh -huh. Um, I'm not positive about that. It just seemed like, you know, like a narrow space that led, you know. Did you guys knock forward. on that door? See if you could get anyone? We attention? didn't. Okay. I think we just, we just walked in that one. So I saw it was open. Um, so we walked in and, you know, you go forward and then, like, all you can do is turn left. And so we turned left and you know, the lights were out. And so we found some light switches and we turned on the lights and, uh, you know, just general looking at seeing if anything weird now, when you guys went in, what, what what did you see? Did you see his roommates at the time? No, we didn't see his roommates until after we looked around downstairs. We looked, we opened his office door, mm -hmm. um, turned on the light in there. Like we were all we were all pretty cautious and scared we were gonna see something. Yeah. And uh, I looked in the bathroom. 
Um, we have to go to the bathroom and then it's office. Uh -huh. The dog came running up to us, you know, it's just a playful dog. So then we went upstairs and Travis's room is right at the top of the stairs. And was the door closed? Or the door was closed. Travis's door was closed. Doors. And it was locked. As the group investigated upstairs for any sign of Travis, they heard music coming from one of the other bedrooms. I heard the music come out of the room and I knocked on the door. And, you know, someone says, um, you know, hold on just, just a second, you know. And I uh, get a knock, at, knock at the door. So I go and I answer the door. They're just like, hey, have you, have you heard from Travis? Have you seen him? Looks like, no, I haven't seen him. As far as I know, he's been out of town. And now, like, because we've been trying to get a hold of him, just can't get a hold of him. We're kind of worried. And I said, did you uh, knock on his door? Maybe, maybe he came back. And they're like, no, or they're like, no, we haven't, we haven't checked his room or anything. So I said, okay, let's go over there. And so I went over there with them. The door was locked, so I went downstairs, and there was a set of keys downstairs. And I said, well, I go to these and open it. I tried a few different ones, found one that worked. He unlocks the door, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he kind of pokes his head in, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of right, you know, right, right behind him, mm -hmm. kind of you near know, to the side, also, you know, kind of peeking in. But, you mm -hmm. know, the first thing you see looking in this way is, you know, his bed right here. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like you know, it was undone and it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't like nicely made or anything. It was just, you know, Zach, I think his name is the roommate. Okay. You know, pokes his head in here and he like looks to the right and he says, oh my God. And at this point he says that and all I'd seen is the bed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of turns right and walks in a little bit and I follow him in. You know, I look down and, you know, you can see right here, you know, blood on, on the carpet. Then I looked over to the right and I saw a pile of blood on the floor, on the carpet. Then I look down the hallway uh, to his bathroom and I see blood on the floor and the walls and everything. So I went through the um, closet. I went through his closet to the outer outside and then I peeked around the corner and saw him laying in the, uh, in the shower. And then I ran out and told him, uh, I said, Travis is dead, call the police. Mimi called 911. Do you remember hearing what she told the operator? I think she said that, you know, like, I don't know if she said hurt or dead. I, I don't know what she said, but, you know, I, I was getting downstairs and, you know, they're you know, saying, you know, who, who knows what's going on. And so she handed me the phone because I had been there. And, you know, I get on the phone and they say, you know, well, did you see any weapons? And I was like, ah, I, don't remember, I, don't, I don't remember seeing the weapon. Yeah, that's the only question I remember they asked me. But, and then they said, you know, like, get everybody out. So get, I want everybody out of the house. So we walk out the front door. At some point, you know, soon after that, Zach is back outside, you know, he's outside. And this girl that I'm seeing for the first time is outside. And we were on the phone, we're like, is everybody out of the house? And then it was like, someone said, well, Zach went back in because the other roommate was still up in his room. The first officers on scene were quick to secure Travis's room. And the level of brutality inside was startling. Most shocking of all was Travis's body. After an examination, it was determined that Travis was stabbed a total of 27 times across his torso, head, neck, ears, and hands. The stab wounds to Travis's hands were determined to have been defensive wounds, meaning he had tried to protect himself from the oncoming attack. Travis then had his throat slit and was later shot in the head sometime after his death. The examiners were also able to determine that he had been dead for several days before he was found and it was believed that he had died on Wednesday, June 4th, five whole days before he was discovered. The crime scene was also filled with several oddities. Travis's bed sheets had been stripped, and when the authorities searched to see if they were in the washing machine, they discovered that a digital camera had been run through a wash cycle with a load of clothes. Although the camera had suffered severe water damage, police still believed they could access the photos on it. Little did they know that the pictures on the camera would blow the case wide open. In the meantime, the authorities were at a loss. Travis's murder was unbelievably brutal, and it was hard to imagine that anyone could have held this much rage towards him. Every person they interviewed said that Travis was loved by everyone and had no enemies. However, there was one name that kept popping up. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He has a he has an ex girlfriend that's been bothering him and following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex girlfriend's name? Her name is Jody. I heard random talk tonight 
about some crazy girl that I don't know. I've, I've never heard of, uh, but apparently, I mean, I, I just picked on, you know, Ram talking about this tonight about, you know, her slashing his tires, breaking into his house, and about who? his couch. That's some crazy girl. Some girl, but you don't know her name even. Or... I, Jody is what I think but I heard. Is... Told you about any issues with this, uh, this ex-girlfriend? Jody? Jody. Um, I knew Jody oh, actually. Well, what, what, what do you know about her? What has he told you about her? Um, when I first moved in the, into the house, she was actually there and she would come once a week as kind of a, that she would clean the house. Well, she wasn't living there? No, she wasn't. I know that she had, um, that they dated. She lived in California. They dated. And then she moved down here after they broke up. Moved into the same area as he, as him. He, um, was helping her out, so he paid her to clean the house. They would argue from time to time. She'd be in the house and they'd, they'd be arguing. He's like, why are you over here? She'd come over just out and out sometimes. She would um, call at inappropriate times. I thought she would talk to him about it, or not, not necessarily inappropriate things, but just like, um, she would call up asking for advice when he couldn't give advice at all, and you'd tell her I had a lot of trouble with it. I know that uh, I woke, woke up a few mornings um, and he had come up and he's like, did, he's like, did you hear anything this morning? I'm like, what? He's all like, oh, we were arguing in the room. And this, you know, completely after they'd been broken up, but he would just be like, you know, why are you here? You know, you moved down here after the fact. Um, I can understand if you want to try to make it down here, I'll help you, but. Why would he let her in the house? Or she would just kind of come in on her own? I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. He has a little opening for the dog to get in and out, and that's how this... A little uh, dog door? Yeah. There's, like, the, there's the, the ex-stalker girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She would sneak into his house through that. With so many people mentioning Jody's strange and volatile relationship with Travis, she quickly became suspect number one. However, the police weren't confident that she was their killer. Not only was she incredibly cooperative with the investigation, but she was on a trip with some friends in Utah on the day Travis was murdered and was deemed to be too small to inflict the damage done to Travis. Despite their reservations about Jody being responsible, the interviews they conducted continued to point the finger at her. This is Clancy. Hi, Clancy. This is Detective Steve Flores with the Mesa, Arizona Police Department. I received a message to give you a call that you might have some pertinent information. One of the girls that I know um, was affiliated with Travis. He broke up with her. She okay. came through um, Utah. Her name's Jody, and we all work the same the same business. We all are associates with Prepaid Legal. She came through here, and she just has kind of a weird story. And I figured you would want to talk to the person that she was talking to all the way here. I guess there was like 20 hours. She had her phone off. Nobody knows where she was at. It just doesn't make any sense. She took oh. over 20 hours to get here. I just, it's just weird. Now, when did she take this trip? Tuesday, supposedly. She didn't get here till Thursday. So she took a trip, leaving on Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Where was she leaving? Supposedly California, but I, I don't know. And, and for what reason was she taking this trip? Um, we're not really sure. When she called Ryan, she said that she was coming through Utah, and she just gave him a call so that she could stop by and see him when she was passing through, but she told other people that she was coming here to see him. He didn't know that. But the more I talked to him, mm -hmm. the stranger it is because, like, I don't know how long of a drive it is, but I know it's not a 20-hour drive or longer. I don't know how long it took her to get here. She was supposed to be here on Wednesday, and we have a systems training that we attend. She didn't show up. People were trying to reach her on Wednesday, and nobody talked to her until about 10.30 when she finally called him. I don't know where she was during that time. She said that she got lost, um, that she took a nap, that she cleaned her car, that she ran out of gas. It just doesn't all fit together. With this information, it became clear that Jody's alibi wasn't as solid as it seemed to be. Detective Flores mapped out Jody's supposed trip from Wairika, California to Salt Lake City, Utah, and assuming she had stopped for an entire 10 hours, the trip would have only taken her 29 hours. She then calculated a similar trip, but he added in a stop to Travis's home of Mesa, Arizona. This trip would take around 37 hours, meaning there are at least 10 to 11 hours in Jody's trip where she's suspiciously unaccounted for. 
could Jody be capable of a murder so heinous? As Detective Flores interviewed Lisa Andrews, another ex-girlfriend of Travis, he realized that Jody was capable of a lot more than he thought. Travis and I were dating back then, and uh, he was over at my house late one night, and his tires were slashed, and we were like, well, that's weird, you know, and we just kind of thought it was a random neighborhood thing. Oh, and we had received a knock on the door that night, but didn't notice anything about the tires until later. But then the next night, same thing, we hear a knock on the door, and he, like, runs out really fast to see what's going on and didn't see anybody. His tires were slashed again. And then the next morning, I have this email just kind of calling me a and all these terrible things. So that's when we knew it had to be, you know, we were definitely targeted. Months later, like in February, my I was at his house and my tires were slashed. I mean, I still have the email. I just have it saved and, you know, I just didn't want to delete it just in case anything came of it. It was sent um, December 8th at 8.52 a.m. It's from John Doe. That's what it says. What does it say exactly? Do you just want me to read it to you? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, this is kind of terrible. It says, you are shameful. Your Heavenly Father must be deeply ashamed of all you've committed with that insidious man. If you let him stay in your bed one more time or even sleep under the same roof as him, you will be giving the appearance of evil. You are driving away the Holy Ghost and you are wasting your time. You're also compromising your salvation and breaking your baptismal covenants. All, of all the commandments to break, committing acts of one of the most displeasing in the eyes of the Lord. You cannot be ashamed enough of yourself. You're filthy, and you need to repent and become clean in the eyes of God. Think about your future husband and how you disrespect not only yourself, but him, as well as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Is that what you want for yourself? Your future, your salvation, your posterity is resting on your choices and actions. You are a daughter of God, and you have been a shameful example. Be thou clean, sin no more. Um, Heavenly Father loves you and wants you to make the right choices. I know you're strong enough to choose the right. Your Father in Heaven is pulling for you. Don't ignore the promptings you receive because they are vital to your spiritual well-being. Jody's religious rant may represent more than just her using religion to manipulate others. In her email to Lisa Andrews, Jody shows signs of religious preoccupation, which can be typical of individuals with personality disorders, psychotic disorders, and or bipolar disorder. In religious preoccupation, the person can come off as being completely detached from reality. The contents of Jody's rant-like email to Lisa seem like an indication of mental illness. It's possible that Jody may think she's chosen for some type of divine purpose of spreading the teachings of God. It was immediately clear to Detective Flores that this email came from Jody, and he started to get a sinking feeling. If Jody was willing to threaten and slash the tires of a woman just for dating Travis, what exactly would she be willing to do to the man himself? As evidence at the crime scene was processed, more and more was starting to stack against Jody, and it seemed clear that she was somehow involved. On July 14, 2008, a handful of Arizona detectives flew to Jody's home of Wairika, California, with the intent of arresting her for Travis's murder. When Jody was finally located by the police at her grandparents' house, she was observed packing clothes into a suitcase as though she was taking a trip. However, before she could leave, there was an officer on her doorstep with handcuffs and an arrest warrant. Jody's parents accompanied her to the police station and were able to give Detective Flores some crucial insight into Jody's behavior. Jody has mental problems. Jody would freak out all the time. I, I met quite a few of her friends call me and tell me that I needed to get her some help. She would just totally flip out on me. And I had one of her friends call me in the middle of the night, call us one night and say, you need to get Jody some help. What do you mean she would flip out on you? What? Just like call me one minute happy and the next minute in tears. Like she was a total different person. You feel like you wanted to help her, but she wouldn't let you. Kind of yeah, and she wouldn't ever tell me what she was crying about. But it was like a total, I mean, like something would snap and she would all of a sudden be in tears and call me back. Jody's mom is describing sudden shifts in mood that are a common feature of someone with bipolar 1 disorder. People with this disorder go through manic episodes whereby they may seem to be happy about something, often even very excited about plans they're making or things they want to do. But then the slightest issue can set them off into uncontrolled emotion such as anger, rage, or sobbing. Their moments of happiness or excitement are excessive because these individuals often display very high energy to the point of agitation. 
Now she was a strange person because some, you know, after she left the house, she just kind of got a little strange. You know, she's really friendly sometimes. She'll call and real sweet. And 10 minutes later, she'll come and they call in her rage, you know, and just screaming at my wife. She did that for her. She, for the last year and a half, she was doing that a lot. Jody would call me. We don't have a good relationship, me and Jody. Yeah, your husband kind of told me about the relationship. And, and she would call me in the morning all happy and call me an hour or two later in tears, crying and sobbing about something she didn't want to talk about. And that happened constantly. Jody's very sick. Yeah, Jody doesn't, she just, it's the way she is. Jody's dad was also able to provide Detective Flores with information on the trip Jody was packing for at the time of her arrest. You know, she working as a bartender still? Or was she was. She yeah. Was and, well, I don't know if it was you that called her yesterday or in Naples. No, it wasn't me. Somebody called her, and then uh, she just got a little hysterical and quit her job. Last night after she came back, when I guess she was on her way back, Jody called me. She needs me to pick her up at 7.30 in the morning to take her to uh, the rental place to, so she could be down. And I thought, I thought it was going to be for good. Yeah, and I'm thinking, mm. and, then, and then when I took her, sticker, she goes, oh, don't worry, Dad, I'm only going to be gone for three days. She didn't say where she was going or anything. She didn't tell me nothing. Did she ever have any access to any any firearms or anything? She just got a gun. Uh, she had a gun as a... I don't know. Was it recent one? Yeah, she just got it. Oh, you know what she mentioned? Did she, she mentioned a Glock or something? I don't know. She just told me she got a gun. I said, what do you need a gun for? She goes, where I'm going, I might need one. Oh, okay. And I goes, well, where are you going? I can't tell you. I said, I just want to feel safe where I go. With a better understanding of Jody's behavior and mindset, it's finally time for Detective Flores to confront her with the truth. So you remember me? Of course I do. Jody seems to be employing the romancer strategy and lying, similar to that of Ted Bundy. Jody is likely trying to please the detective so he will question whether she is truly guilty. I traveled all the way up here and talk to you because you know I've been working on Travis's case ever since it happened mm -hmm. okay and I know exactly when it happened when he was killed I know a lot of details and just recently we found quite a bit of evidence and I'll discuss that with you the main thing that I'm looking for though is answers on why certain things happened why they went so far and also to get your statements. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, let's, let's start with this. What have you been up to since, um, since Travis's death? Well, what have you been doing? I've been kind of in a daze, at least for the first few weeks. Like everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of people have been posting on Facebook really nice things you know, and memories, and at one point I was like, well, maybe I should do that, so I posted this thing, and I just set all my memories, and I realized looking back on it that it was kind of, it kind of sounded immature, it's more of like my dear Travis kind of letter, and so I took it down, because... More personal? Yeah, some of it was detailed, <clears throat> more personal, not too personal, nothing inappropriate, just, um, I just felt funny. I think because I'm a photographer, I tend to communicate more into pictures, so I posted a ton of pictures that I had of him, um, and I have a ton more that I just can't access right now. Surprisingly, Jody is the first one to bring up suspicions about herself. I didn't realize until I actually spoke with Ryan Burns. He, he told the guy that's in Utah. And we've been talking a lot, and we try not to talk about that, because it's kind of like, ugh. And plus, Travis is my ex-boyfriend, but at the same time, he's my friend. So while I'm warning my friend, how do you talk to your new potential, possible, maybe, person that you might start dating about your friend, even though he was your ex-boyfriend? So it's kind of a gray area. I try not to talk about him too much, but he comes up a lot. Jody is talking really fast, which may be normal for her, but could be a sign of her anxiety. She's also groomed her hair and touched her nose a fair amount already. The grooming specifically could be a sign that Jody wants to be liked by the detective. And it was through him that I learned that he said, you know, if you come out to Utah, things are really weird because everyone is everyone thinks that you yeah. could have had a, um, a hand. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people and everybody's pointing a finger at you. I know. You know, everybody is saying, I don't understand what happened to Travis. I don't know who killed him, but you need to look at Jody. 
And sometimes the simplest answers are the correct ones. And that's one of the reasons I started looking at you a little bit closer. Over the last month or so, I, I've, I've gotten into Travis's life, talked to all his friends, his family. I got a really good understanding of who he is now. I got a very good understanding of your relationship with him. And it was that blonde chick with the crazy eyes. And in my mind, I was like, Joey, kill him. But we would joke about it with him. Like, she's going to chop you up in little pieces. And he's, he would just laugh. Although Jody is playing along with Detective Flores, it's clear that she doesn't realize just how much he knows about her and Travis's relationship. I know the relationship that you guys had was of convenience sometimes. Obviously, you weren't boyfriend and girlfriend anymore, <laughs> but you were still having a sexual relationship, which... Does his you know, family know about that? Just curious. No, just his family doesn't know anything. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm interested in protecting his, how he's remembered as well, and... Well, I'm sure if Travis could speak right now, he wouldn't care what people thought about him, because they knew who he was, okay? And a sexual relationship here or there, because the fact he was a member of the church really doesn't matter. I think in the broad scope of things that that could be right. Jody is engaging in some facial rubbing and distortion here, and looks like she's pursing her lips. All signs that, despite her calm voice, she's feeling stressed. As hinted at by Detective Flores, Mormons forbid premarital intimacy, meaning that both Travis and Jody were breaking the rules by sleeping with each other. However, as Detective Flores has also likely noticed, Jody seems more concerned about people knowing she and Travis were sleeping together than she is about people thinking she may have played a part in Travis's death. Yeah, as far as the timeline, we broke, I, well... It was kind of a mutual thing, but I, I sort of more broke up with him. Yeah. Um, and I, it was hard to do because I really loved him. But I just realized that without trust, you can't have anything. And I had violated his is that, trust. Is that the main reason you guys broke up? Is to trust? The trust. There's not no, not that the relationship was unhealthy because of uh, sexual activity, um, but just that you guys couldn't trust each other. I think that with Travis... Um, there was part. There was a part of me that felt really guilty because there was something inside that thought, "You're, you're, you know, this is nice for instant gratification, but you're destroying what you could have with Travis." Although Jody may have been claiming to feel guilty, she didn't seem to care about who else was hurt by her and Travis's continued intimacy. I mean, I didn't know about him and Lisa at first. During that time that he was seeing Lisa. Did you continue to, to see him as well? Yeah, and I didn't know that he was seeing her. Okay. Jody may claim not to know about Travis and Lisa's relationship, but Lisa's slash tires and threatening email seem to paint a different story. And obviously you guys kept this relationship hidden from everybody else, because nobody really knew about it. There were some people who, who I talked to and said, yeah, they continued to have a relationship even after they broke up. And there are others who, said, who are saying that you had become obsessive with him to the point to where you would go into his house when he wasn't there or when you weren't invited. And he would talk to people saying, you know, she, she just kind of showed up and I don't want to tell her to leave, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want her here. Oh, there were, a, that was, you must know, have been like, early on because yeah. there were a couple times when we established a rule early on, just don't, you know, don't come over and let, he said, you can come over anytime, but I need to know first. The more people knew about us associating, the more stress we both got from it. Mm -hmm. It was just easier to try and keep it a secret and it, we, we didn't always do a good job with that. It was true. They definitely hadn't managed to keep their relationship hidden. Amanda McBrien, the girlfriend of Zach, Travis's roommate, was also at the home when Mimi placed the 911 call. Though she was mostly just an acquaintance, she'd encountered Jody while spending time with her boyfriend at the residence. I know his ex-girlfriend or whoever used to be the house cleaner. That's Jody. I met her a couple times. When she was there, I mean, briefly, she'd be putting my dishes or whatever. She was working as a, as a housekeeper then? Yeah, well, that's what I, I heard, that she did some house cleaning, but I don't know, I don't know what the arrangement was. Was I mean, she I don't, there? No. When she but she there? was there, like, all the time. But I knew they had, like, a falling out. They were just, really, like, that drama. What does that mean? I don't know, I just heard, I know what it means, like, on again, off again. I just know that 
there was some tension between them, I guess. You know, he wanted to move on and live a life, and she'd always be hanging around, and he tried to tell her that, you know, she can't keep scaring off, you know, everyone else. But he kept saying, Jody, I want to go date other people, and I guess he was even dating someone else. The girl ended it because she didn't like that Jody was always there. Jody can partially explain her odd behavior towards Travis, but Detective Flores knows something isn't adding up with her. You've kind of given me a really good uh, rundown of your relationship and how you guys thought of each other and stuff. And, and I was pretty pretty close to right on with my, with my theory on how you guys, you know, why you continue to see each other and what was going on during that time. I think there's some other things that you're not telling me. I think the jealousy probably continued even after the fact that you moved away. Well, the first week of, of June, you took a trip to Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You had, you had left, I think it was like a Monday. No, like Monday, June 2nd. I think it was morning. So you took a trip and you decided instead of going over to Utah, you went straight out to Los Angeles area. I went to Santa Cruz first. Santa Cruz. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I stayed the night in Monterey. And the next day I drove to <clears throat> Pasadena. Okay. Waiting for Laura to call me back. And for a while I was lost. And I'm not above sleeping in the car, so I slept for a while. I looked at a map, and I'm pretty sure I know where I went. I went, can I draw you a map? Sure. Jody tries to describe the supposed route that she took, but Detective Flores isn't fooled. So you, you took this trip, and you left on, was it Monday the 2nd? And you didn't get to Utah until, until Thursday, and that's the 5th. It's like 48 hours there that... I have a problem with this trip. I've gone over this trip over and over in my mind and on paper. There's still 20 some odd hours, even if you pulled over to sleep. Did I tell you that I got stranded? Yeah, you mentioned that. If you slept for 10 hours, I only slept for here and here, it would still leave 18 some odd hours for something else. Okay. This is what people are focusing on is this trip that you took because they're saying she left she didn't get to till Thursday Wednesday that's when Travis was killed I did not go near his house isn't there I pulled your cell records your cell phone was turned off between here and here okay but the last place it pulled it was here the next place it turned on was here what does that show me Oh, well, I began... Oh, no, no, no. Is there plenty of time for you to do that? Yes. And I... Do I believe that you had come to visit Travis? Yes. I truly believe it. Did you have the opportunity? Yes. You were traveling alone. There's no other witnesses. Your phone just happened to turn off from here to here. Well, I didn't turn it off physically, but it died. And then it magically... You, I got you it. found your charger here? It was... I was under the packed under the seat of the passenger side, and it was when I was... When you were lost, you couldn't have maybe pulled over and found it, or...? Well, I did finally start looking when I was stranded. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pulled over when I was lost. Jody continues to adamantly deny being anywhere near Travis's house on her trip, but little does she know that Detective Flores is about to crack her story wide open. Throughout the interview so far, Jody has had a relatively flat affect, There hasn't been much change in intonation going on at all. The question is, is this how she normally talks, or is this an act for the officer? Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was was nowhere near Mesa. I was nowhere near Phoenix. Here, Jody's illustrators are really mistimed, and the emphasis points do not match at all. This is a sign of brain-body mismatch, meaning she could be saying one thing, but thinking something entirely different. I wasn't even close to him. What if I could show you proof you were there? Mm-hmm. Would that change your mind? I wasn't there. You can be honest with me, Jody. I was not at Travis's house. You were at Travis's house. You guys had a sexual encounter. There's pictures. And I know you know there's pictures. Because I have them. I will show them to you. So what I'm asking you is for you to be honest with me. I know you were there. Are you sure those pictures aren't from another time? Positive. Absolutely positive. The last time I had any kind of sexual contact with Travis was in April. 
Remember I told you about the camera? Mm -hmm. That camera was damaged. Someone put it in the washing machine, ran it through a wash cycle with some clothes of Travis's. But the card's intact. Remember I told you that card was destroyed? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell you the truth because I wanted to make sure those photos were accurate. And we can pull deleted photos. I don't care if you delete them six months ago. We can pull every photo that was ever on there. Get the timestamps on them. Not all of them, but most of them have timestamps on them. And we can verify those timestamps. Mm -hmm. Jody seems to freeze here and almost stop moving entirely. One reason that learning about the camera left her unsettled is that she may not have accounted for this evidence in her story. Now she has to figure out what exactly is on the camera and how she can integrate it into her story, causing her to have a high cognitive load in this moment. And I have pictures of you in Travis's bedroom with Travis, pictures of him, and it's obvious you guys are having sex, taking photos of each other, and they're dated and time stamped on the day he died. Are you sure it's me? I mean, that because I was not there. This is an odd question to ask because she wouldn't need to ask if he's sure it's her. If she was confident, she wasn't there. If she knew she wasn't there, then she would strongly deny it. Instead, she tiptoes around trying to gather more information. She needs to do this in order to now incorporate any more information into her story. This is an example of the liar's loop as she now needs to adjust her lie to fit with the evidence. Jody also gives away her anxiety in this moment by engaging in an anchor point shift. It's you. And you know it's you. I know all the details of this case. The only thing I don't know is why. Why did you choose to go visit Travis that day? And why did you do what you did? This is part of the read technique. He's brushing off her denial so she doesn't become entrenched in her lies. He also states clearly that he already knows she did it in order to stop her from trying to fold in any new information into her story, as she's been doing so far. I know you took pictures of him in the shower just before he died. I don't think he would allow that. Mm -hmm. And the camera actually took a couple of photos by accident during the time that he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Jody, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. As Jody tries to deny the photos, Flores continues to stack the evidence against her. Can I see the pictures? We have your blood at the scene. Your hair with blood at the scene. Your left palm print at the scene. In blood. What's going on there? Well, I can explain the blood and the hair. I don't know about my left palm print. How can you explain the blood and the hair? Well, because I used to bathe Napoleon all the time. And, um... You haven't been there since April. Well, He's had the house cleaned several times since then. And this hair was not just a hair, you know, from the shower or something. This hair was stuck with blood and obviously had blood on it. At the time, it got stuck where it, where it ended up. My There's hair would no have been way. all over. There's no other hair. Can you ever. take can you take a hair sample? We Maybe. have DNA matching that hair oh. too. Okay, I know, but my And that hair had a follicle on it, and that means that that hair wasn't there very long. We have a lot of evidence in the house that points towards her as being the person who committed to murder. Um, the only thing I don't have is why. Why she committed this? The evidence is really damning at this point. I mean, we have so much. I, I've never had this much evidence in a case before. That records check shows you that you just reported a, a gun stolen. 25 auto. Just happens to be the same caliber as the weapon used to kill him. A 25 auto was used to kill Travis. Jody is speaking more loudly and forcefully here as if she's shocked by this information. When someone's volume increases or their speech becomes more forceful, this is usually the result of surprise or anger. The changes subside quickly when these are faked, as Jody has done here. Yeah, along with multiple stab wounds. Jody, if you want, I can show you some pictures of him. 
Do you want to see pictures of him? Part of me does and part of me doesn't. Why, because you don't want to remember? No, I Jody. just, there's a morbid curiosity. Jody. I wanted to know how he died. With Jody admitting that she wants to see the photos, Flores brings them to her. These are just a few photos, and I want to be careful showing, not showing you certain photos because some of them are very bad. That's obviously Travis's house, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes showing a suspect photos and other evidence like this isn't recommended because they could be revealing details that only the killer would know. However, investigators may choose to do this when they already have an overwhelming amount of evidence linking the suspect to the crime. If Travis were here today, he would tell you that I'm dead if it wasn't me. No. My job is to speak for Travis right now. And everything Travis is telling me is that Jody did this to me. Have you ever shot that 25 auto? Mm -hmm. Have you ever touched it? The one that was stolen? I've never seen it. Where's that one? Remember him? Yeah. Is he naked? Yep. Detective Flores likely chose to show Jody this haunting photo of Travis because it was the one taken of him just moments before he was brutally attacked and murdered. Her reaction, or lack thereof, is disturbing. This is... Travis would never go for that. Soon after you and him had sex on his bed. That couldn't have been too soon after. An hour or so. The last time Two I hours. Said it was an ape. It's you. I wanted to cover you up because... Oh. That's you. All of you. That looks like me. That is you. Right there you have on your face. You can look at the rest of it if you want. There's a few of those. There's a few more. This one I don't know if I should show you, but nothing bad. Too bad. But it's just one of the photos that was taken by accident. And this is just a small portion of it. That's your foot, Joey. These are your pants. No, it's off color because we have to enhance it and the color kind of changes a little bit. This is his bathroom. That is not my foot. These are your pants. It's a different color, like I said, because we have to enhance it and the color changes. The zipper back. I have both of those pants at home. If these are the same one, though. I don't have a zipper there, though. There. You see that? Mm -hmm. That spot? You see the spots here? They look a different color because we used a chemical to enhance this. Mm -hmm. That right there, blood. It's a mixture of yours and his. And that's your palm print of your left palm. Did you have anything to do with the death of Travis? Not, I don't think I had anything directly to do with it, but I feel responsible somewhat for it. Despite this truly undeniable evidence, Jody continues to state that she wasn't involved with the murder. It appears as though she does a downward yes head shake while tripping over her words and does a self-soothing leg rub in the midst of saying, I don't think I had anything directly to do with it, but I feel responsible somewhat for it. Even this skilled liar struggles with her non-verbals and a straight lie the first time. She uses all manner of qualifying statements to not directly say, I didn't kill him when directly asked. Eventually, Flores is forced to be direct with Jody, and her response is shocking. Then what can you tell me about his death? You know a lot more about it than I do. When I say I feel responsible, it's because I, was, I wasn't planning to go there at all, and he really wanted me to go. And I told him no, and I would have if it weren't for Ryan. And there's nothing really with Ryan and I. In fact, he has been very hesitant to move anything forward because he's not sure about me. Um, he said a lot of people are talking. I'll just tell you that right now. I really wish this would get solved so that we can just put it behind us. Um, maybe that's a good thing because he's not an active church member anyway. But the reason I feel is because if I had, if it weren't for Ryan, I would have folded and I would have just scrapped all my plans and spent all of my days there. But I didn't, and I stood strong, and he got mad and got sad, and he guilted me. He didn't get really mad. He just kind of guilted me. And finally, I was like, whatever, fine. And we hung up. 
I feel that if I would have gone there, that I could have done something. Jody's rambling response doesn't make much sense, and it seems that Detective Flores is beginning to doubt that she'll do the right thing and tell the truth. When I asked you, I always, I always asked this one question. Actually, it's two. First one is, did you kill Travis? And you kind of hesitate a little and said, I, no, I didn't have anything to do with it. Then I asked you a similar question. Did you have anything to do with Travis's death? You hesitated again. That's because I feel like if I had gone to Arizona like you Most asked, people would say, no. Did you kill Travis? No. Well, I didn't, and I didn't have anything to do with it. Now, do I feel responsible? I've been carrying around guilt since I heard about it. Jody's anchor point shift, combined with shaking her head yes, fit the description of a cluster and indicate that she's being deceptive. Why do you feel responsible? If you felt responsible, it means you know something else. No, because it means I your think... actions led to his death. Because he always has guilted me. Jody begins testing the waters and painting herself as a victim. As you'll see, she'll come back to this angle later on. Well, so you feel somebody fun. else you feel somebody else killed him? Well, yeah. For what reason? I don't know. I don't know then that. How do you feel guilty because if you don't know the reason? Here's why I feel guilty. The, one of the last times we spoke, he was guilting me about not coming to see him. And part of my heart still wanted to go see him. And another part just wants to move on and pursue this new avenue, mm -hmm. which was in Utah. And there is a tinge of guilt. You know, when he would text me and he would say, hey, you want to come over and make out or want to come, da, da, da. I didn't respond one night and I just stayed strong and I didn't respond. And then he called and called and called. And then the next day he was like, you don't care about me. You don't love me. You don't care. I was there all alone. I still don't get the guilt. I really don't. You keep explaining it, but it has nothing to do with whether he, because he guilted was killed me. or not. This explanation from Jody paints an interesting picture of Travis, although it's hard to tell if what she's saying is true or if she's just trying to make herself look like a victim of his manipulation. Regardless, Detective Flores is desperate to find any reasonable explanation for Jody's behavior. I know if you had never met him, you'd probably still be lying. That's true. Yeah, that's because you killed him. No. If I did anything that had anything to do with his death in any way, it's not if to me. It's not if at all. Well, to me it is. I would I would be more than remorseful. Is it maybe something you're blocking out of your head? I don't think so. I mean, I tend to write everything down. Detective Flores is more than familiar with Jody's journaling tendencies as several of her journals were seized during a search of her room. In the journals, Jody meticulously detailed her life, her relationships, and her innermost thoughts. However, there were suspiciously no entries at all relating to her supposedly disastrous road trip or the time she spent with her friends in Utah. For someone who loves to write about their life, these seem like strange exclusions. However, she did write about Travis's death and the days following. It reads, Travis is dead. What happened? Travis, what is this? Two days after his death, Jody wrote, So I've been numb mostly, but last night was extremely hard. I broke down as I finally brought myself around to going to bed. It was 2.30 a.m. I wanted so badly to call Travis, but knowing he wouldn't answer was too much to bear and knowing he wasn't calling me anytime soon was just killing me. I broke down as I climbed into bed and cried and cried and cried until I fell asleep. The next day, Jody made a shorter, stranger entry. It just feels like he hasn't called me in too long. I hear him singing. I hear him laugh. Having given up on Jody, Detective Flores leaves the room and prepares to have her transferred to jail. With no one watching her, Jody begins to drop her facade. I didn't hear you breathe. I wonder how am I still here. me. Shining. This is the day of our dear 
<laughs> this bizarre behavior in the interrogation room seems to be a sign of her lack of impulse control. Most people would recognize doing a handstand is not appropriate given the setting, but she seems to be highly impulse-driven. Sitting in silence with her thoughts would probably be too stressful. There's no one here giving her attention any longer, and she has to do something to fill her time. Someone with pathological narcissism craves attention. It's a need for her, so without current attention, perhaps she's also doing things to gain attention. Only Jody really knows, and she probably wouldn't tell the truth about what's driving her. Though her laugh may not be a psychotic laugh, it's definitely very bizarre. It seems like she paused and looked upward as if thinking of something and then laughed. <laughs> this is very unnerving given the reason that she's in that room. The fact that she's singing to herself in a Disney princess tone also adds to the overall eeriness of this whole scene. Jody's official diagnosis is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder, BPD, is characterized by intense and unstable emotions, difficulties in maintaining stable relationships, a fragile sense of self-identity, and impulsive behaviors. Individuals with BPD often experience extreme shifts in their mood, going from intense anger or sadness to moments of feeling relatively fine. They might struggle with fears of abandonment and exhibit impulsive actions such as self-harm, reckless spending, or substance abuse. People with BPD may also have a distorted sense of self, often seeing themselves as fundamentally flawed or empty. Building and maintaining healthy relationships can be challenging for them due to their intense emotions and fears of rejection. However, there's a lot of debate about this diagnosis for Jody as some professionals don't believe it fits her actions as a whole and was just an attempt to explain her otherwise unexplainable behavior. After spending the night in jail, Jody seemingly has a change of heart and asks to speak with Detective Flores again. While the detective may have been hopeful that Jody was going to finally tell him the truth, nothing could have prepared him for everything she was going to reveal. And did, did Travis know you were coming? He knew? I saw you kind of shake your head a little bit at home. This is hard. It's okay. Did he know you were coming? Did you guys talk on the phone? Did you guys talk when you were when you were en route to, to Phoenix? Yeah. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, I was nowhere near Mesa. I wasn't even close to him. So he knew you were coming? He, he was expecting you? Now, obviously, you guys had, you know, a little encounter. And is that when those pictures were taken? Do you remember what time you rolled in? 3 p.m. It's still dark. Um, Wednesday morning? I think. Yeah, that makes sense. For the first time since her interviews began, it seems like Detective Flores might be making progress with Jody. She even seems to have just accidentally admitted that she was taking the photos before Travis died. Did you guys spend the whole day together then? That following day? Did you guys go anywhere? You stayed in the house? Slept. Well, after a long trip, I'd sleep too. The pictures that I showed you of you lying on the bed and stuff, is that when those were taken that day? Yeah, we also made a video. We deleted it. What happened after that? What, what went wrong? The last photos of him were taken about 5.20, 5.30. And you said he doesn't like, uh, he doesn't like you to take pictures of him and stuff. He was very private about the shower, like we... Is that why you were taking pictures of him in the shower? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Trying to get back at him? No, um... I'm surprised he allowed you to take pictures of him in the shower. The first few looked like he wasn't too comfortable, but... Obviously, whatever you were saying to him made him a little more comfortable. I remember that clearly. You remember that? What went wrong? While Jody might be slowly starting to open up, she's still resistant to tell Detective Flores the whole truth. Something or someone is holding her back. Um, there I... were several photos of him 
And the last one that we have is him sitting in the shower. And that's when I think it happened. He was sitting down, looking up at you. What did you do? After a long stretch of silence, Jody finally makes her big reveal. Jody. Why not? Are you protecting somebody else? Why would somebody else do this? I don't know. Did someone catch you there? Someone not expecting you to be there? I didn't see my car. Then who was it? I don't know. I can tell you everything that I know or that I remember. Okay. What do you remember? From the time you were taking the pictures to the time you left, what happened? Jody seems to use her hair to cover her face here, trying to not give anything away with this newer story. I don't know who they were. They know where I live. Mm -hmm. Or they know where my parents are. I don't know if they know where my grandparents are, but they got my address and they know where my family is. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to say you're doing this to protect your family? Why would someone do this to you and to him? I don't think they really intended to do anything to me. You're saying somebody followed you all the way to Arizona from here? No, I don't think, that I think I was an element of surprise for them. You were an element of surprise? So they didn't expect I, you to be there? I don't think so. Were they going after Travis? For what reason? You tell me this, but you give me no reason. They didn't discuss much. They just argued. About what? About whether or not to kill me. For what reason? Because I'm a witness. A witness of what? Him. Of Travis. Of Travis's murder. Yeah, but I didn't really witness it. I didn't see much. Because... Oh. You need to make this believable because it is not believable to me right now. Jody revealing that two men broke in and killed Travis could be a huge break in this case, if it's true. While Detective Flores has made it clear that he doesn't believe this story, that's not going to stop Jody from finally revealing her side of the story, starting with her taking pictures of Travis in the shower. I asked him if I could do pictures of him in the shower, and he's like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I just have an idea. I have a couple ideas. And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, I said, I have this, I, I saw this thing in a Calvin Klein at once that looked really good. And so he was, you're right, he wasn't very comfortable at first. He goes, he's standing there and he's all, I feel gay. <laughs> the one that you showed me yesterday of him looking right at you, I think that's a great picture. He hates it. I don't know what he hates about that. I think it's a very good picture of him. With deception, often people have to tell their stories from the beginning to get everything in in the order that they want it. Answering questions doesn't allow them to get the lie out properly. Here she has to control the telling of the story in order to tell it how she wants. What happened when the last picture was taken? He was kneeling down in the shower. I don't remember him. If, he, like, if this is his shower and the sink is over here, I was like right here taking pictures. And I don't really know what happened after that, exactly, except I think he was shot. Where were you? Um, if this is his shower, I was sitting here, I was like, well, if this is his shower, I was sitting here, I was like right here on my knees in his bathtub, I was right here, and I was taking him here, and I was just going through the pictures, and I heard this loud ring. I don't really remember, except Travis was screaming. I think I got knocked out, but I don't think it was that long. Jody says, don't really know what happened after that, and don't really remember in rapid succession. These are selective memory statements which allow her to answer while leaving room for her to adjust her story later on. These are huge red flags, but so is how she's positioned right now. She's completely closed off here with her feet awkwardly up in the chair. Immediately, Detective Flores has issues with this story, starting with the fact that Travis was shot post-mortem, so there's no way that was the first injury he sustained, as Jody is claiming. Still, Flores lets her continue digging herself into a hole. What'd you say? 
I remember putting my hand on his back because he was on his, all four of his knees. He was like on his knees like this, doing something like this or something like, I don't know. And I was like, I was like, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? And he's like, go get help, go get help. And I said, okay. And I turned around there were two people there. One was a guy, one was a girl. What did she say? What words did you hear? Who is that? I thought he was by himself or alone or something. And he was like, shut up, just finish it. And, and what happened? Well, as soon as he said, go get help, I turned around and I was, they were there. And Where were they? They were in the bathroom. The girl was in the hallway and the guy was more toward in the bedroom, but like still in the bathroom. He started coming in toward the bathroom too, and I... What happened? What happened, Jody? What did you see? <laughs> I took it out of my gun. He stopped you. And Travis, he was still like conscious and still alive. And um, you just left them there. No, I, I ran into the closet because like there's two doors and they were sort of in the hallway already. And he stopped me. And he didn't touch me. He was just held the gun to my head and he was like, "You don't go anywhere." And he told, he told the other girl to finish it. I, didn't see. He told me to stay there and not to move. And where was that in the closet? No, it was, um, I was like this. He was walking this way and she was already right here. And then he stopped me here. And he said, don't move. He left the room for a minute. And I didn't have my stupid phone because it wasn't charged. And Travis's phone was downstairs and I didn't know his roommates I didn't think were home at the time. So, like, I was just trying to think if there's any way I could call 911 or call or, or get out of the house. There's no way out except downstairs. She was over him, and I just rushed her, and I pushed her. Travis was bleeding everywhere. What was she doing to him? Because he'd been shot at this time, right? Yeah, but he was still alive. This part of her story is interesting because it's almost as if she's trying to make herself a hero. Yet there are a lot of signs of her uncertainty as she tells this version, such as her stumbling speech and misspoken men versus man and woman. He was on his, all four of his knees. I could call 911 or call or, or get out of the house. It's clear that this story is not nearly as well thought out as some of her later versions. And what happened? Oh, it didn't really deter her. Um, Did she have any weapons on her at all? Oh, uh, yeah. What'd she have? Um, she, I thought she was the one with the gun, but maybe she had the gun, but he had a gun. So I there were two guns or, they, or one gun, I don't know. But she's the one who shot him though, right? I would think so, because, I mean, I do, I, I don't know, I got hit here somewhere. Although Detective Flores's question seemed to be throwing her for a loop, Jody continues to stumble through her story. So what happened, after, what happened after your first time? Um, I, I got Travis and he wasn't like standing up. He was starting to just get weaker and weaker. And this guy came back in and she said that um, they, they needed to do me too because it was there. And he's like, no, that's not why we're here. How was she gonna get you? Did she have a weapon? She had a knife. You said she had a gun before. I know that he had a gun. I don't know if she had a gun or not. Why, why didn't they kill you? He said that's not what we're here for. But it was obvious they were there for him. It didn't, they didn't say why. No way. Did you see there. them hurt him anymore? Other than a gunshot? Um, she had a knife and I didn't, I don't know. It's hard to imagine that Jody wouldn't have noticed Travis being stabbed 27 times. When she rushed me afterward, or she came back, I rushed her, but she kind of came back at me. Why didn't she? Travis you? and I were right about here, maybe? I don't know. Halfway, I don't know. And there was a little bit of a struggle with her and I. Um, I was so scared. I'm not 
a person who fights. By stating that she's not a person who fights, she's trying to make herself seem meek. Earlier, she was trying to be a hero or savior, but now she's creating an image of herself where she couldn't possibly have been the killer. Uh, so I wasn't sure. I just knew I had to hold on to her hands because she had a knife. It was certainly a feat of strength for Jody to come out of a knife fight with no injuries. So it seems odd that she would give Detective Flores so few details about the struggle. He grabbed my wallet and he was looking through it. He just did the cash, put it in his pocket. He got my registration out of my wallet and he said, you must be that from California. He was calling like this with my um, registration. And he said, you ever, ever, ever say anything about this? He said, they'll do to my family the same way and me. And I didn't care so much about me at that point. He said, you need to leave and don't you call anybody. You know, you say anything. You know, you act like anything happened. He's all, I'm giving you one chance. And she said she's going to rat us off. She's going to say something. And he was like, shut up. Once again, Jody is making herself out as the hero by claiming that she didn't care so much about herself at that point. Did you leave at that point? Um, I left the room. I went downstairs and I went outside. I wanted to get help. I just wanted to get help. With her tale haphazardly completed, it's time for Detective Flores to dig into it. Did you get hurt at all? You said you were fighting with her. Yeah. What happened to you? Um, she got me. Where at? My hand. Let me see. Where at? Here, Could she you can't me? see it. It was, it was conveniently, it was right on the crease. Well, it's kind of in purple or coloring. It's a little slice there. Yeah. Just a small one? Or was it pretty deep? I don't know how deep it was, but my finger hurt for a while. And that cut that you're showing me there, it's pretty obvious how that happened. I've seen that before. That happens when a knife slips through someone's hand because of blood. It's slippery. And it cuts. That's what that is. I've done this for a long time. And this is the most far-fetched story I've ever heard. And it's not going to help you. Is that how you want to leave this? I just don't want my family to hurt. Your family will not get hurt. The way you're hurting your family is by not coming forward and telling me the truth. There is a reason why you did this, and you just refuse to tell me why. We know you had a 25 auto. You guys reported it stolen. We covered the ammunition, and it matches. We recovered the shell casing. It matches the ammunition. It prints your blood, your hair, the motive. There's you were there. He was probably standing above him when he was in the shower. And you shot him in the head. Despite his pleading, Jody has no intention of telling Detective Flores her motive. Determined to figure out what Jody's still hiding, he sends in Detective Blaney, hopeful that she might be able to pry the truth from Jody. The reason that I wanted to talk with you this morning, there's a couple of reasons actually. I have been privy to the investigation and uh, all of the evidence in this case and to your conversation with Detective Flores yesterday. It's obvious to me that uh, you're not our typical suspect. You know, you, you come from a, um, a good home, a good family. Your parents obviously care about you. Since Travis's death, she has been the best relations that we've had in our whole life. And I said, maybe this death has made her see that life is short and you have to, you know, you can't, you can't be this way. And, and it's changing her. The last few weeks, I talked to her more than I have ever talked to her since she left the house at 18. Um, and you're a bright girl. You're probably uh, more intelligent than you were letting on yesterday. There's no question in my mind or any of the other investigators mind that you were the person that took Travis's life. The detective keeps complimenting Jody, which is likely her attempt to play good cop. She's hoping that appealing to Jody's more self-serving and perhaps narcissistic tendencies might get a more believable story out of her. Well, what I'd like to know is determine whether you're a, a cold-blooded, cold-hearted murderer, or are you somebody that got caught up in circumstances and things got out of control? 
I wasn't sure if she did it herself or if she had help with somebody, but she would not tell me. She absolutely just refused. And she's continuing to say that, no, I'm not going to do with that. And she's completely cold about it. Like, no emotion whatsoever. This, this is your opportunity to help yourself out. When the jury looks at it, those are the things that they're going to be mulling around in their mind when they decide what type of sentence to hand out or when they make a recommendation to the judge. Those are the sorts of things that turn a jury. The juries sometimes can be fickle, but I've never seen a case with so much concrete, hard evidence. We don't need you to tell us anything. I'm doing this for you. Arizona's case goes no matter what. They've got a rock solid case. So what you say is basically irrelevant to their case. It's not going to make it any better for them, but it certainly can help you out. How can it help me? I mean, how can what I tell you today affect the media? You take control of the situation as much as you can and paint whatever kind of picture you want to paint of yourself. You may be wondering why an interrogation is necessary if law enforcement truly has all the evidence they need, as the detective has just claimed. This concerns two different aspects of criminal law. First, because detectives can generally lie during an interrogation, they may state that they have all the evidence when, in fact, they don't. Perhaps they have an incomplete picture of the motive. Or maybe they have all the information they need, with the exception of a murder weapon that hasn't yet been located. Lying to get information is one tactic. Another consideration is the confession itself and its role in criminal procedure. There is a concept known as corpus delicti, which means the body of the crime. In criminal law, a bare confession alone is not enough to convict. Additional evidence is needed to prove the defendant actually committed the crime. For example, in some states, a DA cannot introduce a confession without additional evidence to corroborate it. However, the job of convincing a defendant becomes much easier when the confession matches the evidence. It effectively does 99% of the work for the DA. I don't know how much longer you know you want to sit here and, and listen to me talking, but um, I was hoping to kind of drill something into your head and wake you up and show you how you can help yourself. Maybe you're giving me more credit than I deserve for being smart. I don't think so. I just don't see how any of that could help. Note that Jody seemed to focus in on the media rather than her punishment and that it was a detective who presented the idea of Jody taking control of the narrative. Though she dismisses it here, that's exactly what she will do following this. It seems she took the idea from the officer here and later ran with it. What if it could? Wouldn't you want to do everything you could to help yourself? I don't. I think that my situation is hopeless, and I don't think that I can help myself. With this, Jody has made it clear that she won't be giving the police the answers they're looking for. However, she does have one request before the interview is over. I'm not really good at expressing this, so I think I'm just going to write his family a letter. Would you like to write him a letter now? With her pen and paper, Jody began to craft an 18-page letter with the hopes of explaining Travis's death to his family. The contents of the letter were nothing short of shocking. She begins the letter with, Of all the letters I must write, this is one of the most difficult second only to the one I must write my own parents. As Jody recounts her and Travis's tumultuous relationship, she makes concerning allegations against him. Travis never hit me in the face, but he bruised other parts of my body. It was easy to shrug off a few visible bruises with my friends. I could blame it on work or clumsiness. That only happened on two occasions. The second time was on a Tuesday in early April 2008. Two men at the Tempe business briefing actually joked, Why is Travis beating you now? These allegations paint a far darker picture of Travis and Jody's relationship than anyone could have imagined. And it prompted the question, Why had Jody never mentioned this to detectives? To finish off her letter, Jody wrote, I know it would bring you a great sense of closure to know that his killers were brought to justice. Ultimately, the persons responsible will be held accountable. I, however, will not serve one day in prison for a heinous crime in which I had no part. Travis lives. 
He is not far, and it won't be long before you can see him again. One day all of our questions will be answered. I just hope you can all find peace. My prayers are with you and have been since the inception of this nightmare, and so were the prayers of many. Was this letter a genuine attempt by Jody to bring Travis's family some comfort, or was this just another step in her plan to get away with murder? With the public announcement of Jody's arrest, Detective Flores found himself receiving calls from the people Jody was closest to, such as Ryan Burns, the man she was trying to date at the time of Travis's murder. I kind of felt comfortable after I talked to you and I started talking to her again. And, you know, and then I was just like, yeah, she must not have done it. And she's a great girl and shocks me so much. Wow. I know. I know. I just, and nobody expected it. But uh -huh. the, the evidence is just overwhelming. So we can't ignore the evidence, the physical, and, and, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, I mean, obviously it'd be more than something, just her prints in the place, because obviously her prints are probably all over that place, so I wouldn't really necessarily yeah, place her there. But. Yeah, she, she lived there before, so obviously you know, there, there would be some prints in there, but um, some of the physical evidence, which you know, I can't discuss it, it's just overwhelming. So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that she's the one who did this. What do you kind of weird? Did, did you ever talk to her anymore about uh, the situation down down here in Arizona? Yeah, I talked to her a lot. I mean, I talked to her every night. Did she gave any, for... any indication at all that she knew what was going you on. You know, and that's why I feel so foolish about it. You know, she is guilty, and I, I still, I still would love to know that evidence because I'm telling you, like that whole day I was with her. Uh -huh. You would think there would have been one moment would I have been like, you know, why are you acting? I mean, but she was giggling about just silly, mundane things. I mean, we had a very normal day. That was the only day I've ever spent with her, so it's not like I know her incredibly well. But yeah. I, mean, I worked at the psychiatric institute for two and a half years, so I thought that I had a pretty good <laughs> insight on people's character. But, I mean, if she's guilty, obviously that's something I've just learned a giant lesson on. <laughs> but, um... never know. You absolutely never know. And, uh, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of people like this in, in my career. And, you know, when she was taken into custody, she was mm -hmm. being told, hey, you're being arrested for first-degree murder, and they need to talk to you. And she was giggling and smiling, and that's just the way she acts. I, I don't know. And see, I, and I don't know whether to think if she's just trying to be positive about a horrible situation or she's just completely nuts. I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting that he mentions working at a psychiatric unit. A lot of times people think that keeps them from making personal mistakes. Because they have the work experience, they can see it in the day-to-day -day life. But really, this is not the case. When you're living your life and you aren't in work mode, it's easy to miss the signs that you would never miss inside the facility. This is something that gets said a lot. You see even heavily experienced people get duped in their personal life. And it's because you can't live every moment hyper-aware. The idea of Jody smiling and giggling with her new man just hours after she supposedly took Travis's life is bone-chilling. And it gives Detective Flores even more insight into Jody's personality. While she may have been trying to convince everyone that she was a perfectly sweet and kind-hearted woman, her jail calls with her mother show a very different side of her. No, I didn't change the login number. I haven't even gone on it. I gave my password out to my bank accounts over the phone, and you didn't change it? Hello, Jody, that's I such know, a big security I risk. I okay, thought you were going to do that. Jody, don't yell at me, okay? Just tell me what you need. Checking we're talking account. about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and you just let it sit there like a sitting duck for someone else to go hack. Mom, I just want to let you know that what took about 15 minutes just now should have only taken two. Well, Jody, we don't, we're not on this stuff all the time. Mom. I gave I'm you sorry. the website. You didn't give it to me. You just did YouTube. Yeah, how do you spell you and I how do you spell you, tube? Well, I thought YouTube was just the letter U and tube. I don't I go don't on YouTube. You because I'm here, I don't go on YouTube. Well, you don't don't sit out. there and lecture me, Jody. You keep doing that to me now. I'm sorry. It's just the simplest We're, things no. take forever with you, and they're so simple. They're so simple, Mom. Well, it's not simple. You just it's don't simple for you because you you're never on. listen to me. It's simple for you because you're on there all the time. No, it would be simple, too, if you would just listen to what I'm saying. Jody's behavior definitely hints to emotional abuse. She's essentially calling her mom stupid, belittling her, and talking over her. She doesn't want to hear excuses, and she doesn't care how it makes her mom feel. These are more signs of a lack of empathy and those callous and unemotional traits that we see so frequently in narcissistic individuals. Basically, I'm going to ask you for about two or three hundred dollars, okay? 
And that sounds scary, but don't be scared because my mom's going to pay you every penny of it. I have the money in my account. I'm also getting my tax return on Friday, which is $1,600. So she's going to give you the money. Okay? And here's the thing. I'm not concerned about it. What am I doing? You need to call in somebody. You need to call in a place that I'm going to give you the name to and all my passwords and codes. You need to act like you're me, and you need to renew something for the next two years. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I'll, I'll just tell them it's me, and I'll tell them I'm making the payment on your account. They don't care as long as they get for me. No, you can't talk to them for me. It has to be me that they talk to because I'm the only authorized user on my account. But you have to be using Matt's card. You have to be Jody using Matt's card. Jody, I'll just use my card. It's okay. That's fine, but you can't tell them you're Matt. You have to tell them you're Jody Arias, okay? I'll tell them. I, I just won't worry about it. Don't, I'm you're not going to tell them. them. Trust me. I've done this before. You have to be Jody Arias, okay? Trust Jody. Me. I've done this That's for fraud. years. It's not fraud. I'm giving you permission right now, and it's recorded. I'm giving you all my permission to do that. It's fine. This is the only way you can do this. I'll do it. What needs to be done, Jody? Just calm, calm down. But the bizarre jail calls only became stranger from there. Hello? Hey, did you call my, my, my bank? No, Jody, I've been dealing with some other things right now. And he also said you need to quit talking. Who? The guy that was there. I don't know who it was. I don't know who the guy was in the courtroom. Sure. You're going to incriminate yourself somehow, not, not knowing it by mistake or something, say something that they're going to turn around and use against you. That's what they do. They take towns out of context and, and turn things around. You should have not well, the say The whole conversation was recorded to that. I know, but don't say anything without a lawyer. Nothing. Well, don't all talk the lawyers are going to tell me it's not to say anything. Well, don't say anything, Jody. Nothing. Hello, Jody. Hey, Grandpa. How are you? Well, better than you, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, take care of my kitty. Huh? Take care well, of my I'll kitty. I'll take care of her. You know that. I, yeah. I, yeah. She might outlive you guys. So how are you doing today? I'm bored. I read a lot and I watched a couple of Batman movies. I never realized that Batman movies are so psychologically in-depth. They go into the whole psychology of all the villains, and each one has a sad tale to tell why they, why they screwed up and why they are the way they are, and Batman screwed up too, even though he's a good guy. They're yeah. all just psychos. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry, I've cried like so much in the last month and a half that I'm like just trying to be happy right now. So it sucks, I know. But don't be sad for me. Everything sucks, but it's not that bad. It's really not that bad. Like all the bad things you hear about jail, like none of it's happened here. I'm not worried about jail, Jody. I'm worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> Call me insane, but there's part of me inside that's not worried at all. Like eternal, like eternal perspective. Get the eternal perspective for a second. Like I know. There are people in this world that go to prison for life or get the death penalty when they didn't deserve it because that's the, the justice, justice system found them guilty. I also know that guilty people go walk free. And I also know that justice is served every day. So I smiled real pretty for my booking photo. Oh, I'm sure you did, Jody. Why would you do that? Because it's going to be posted all over the freaking CNN. <laughs> Come on. Are you kidding I me? I freaking smiled and tilted my head and everything. You weirdo. I, you know what I thought? This is it, I am a freaking weirdo. I was thinking this morning, oh my gosh, I'm going to have my photo taken and I haven't done any makeup. What if I sit to and it doesn't actually look that bad and I'm so stupid for even caring. But Jody, think, how could you worry about photos right now? I know. I was dumb. I've been um, reading comments on the internet. Oh, good. Tell me what they're saying. Jody, are you sure you want to hear these? Yeah, I'm sure. Don't worry. I've heard, I've heard the worst already. Just tell me what you're reading. It says, how could you smile when you've been accused of something so heinous, evil without a conscience? Aw. What did she say? Um, how can you smile in your mugshot? It, it's funny because I heard that you said the same thing that I said. I was like, well, you know, if thousands of people were going to see it, wouldn't you want to have a good picture? <laughs> <laughs> I smiled for two reasons. One was that reason. The second reason was because the reason I'm in here is because they think that I killed my friend. And if anyone ever knew Travis, they knew that he had a happy and positive outlook on life all the time. And I thought to myself for a split second, what would Travis do? And he was always smiling, and he was known for always smiling. And so he would have done this. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's awful what happened to him, and it's awful what we're all going through here. But he's freaking living it up somewhere. He's not hurting. He's not suffering. He's, he's happy and living life wherever he is. There's no reason to grieve for him. I'm glad that he is where he is now. So, so and I'm a, I'm you upstairs, Google my name, what kinds of things come up? And it says, you know, update murder suspect to Travis Alexander, arrestment and former ex-girlfriend. If I'm it, a former on... ex-girlfriend. Wait, am I an ex-girlfriend or am I a former ex-girlfriend? <laughs> well, some say ex-girlfriend, some say former girlfriend. Oh, oh. <laughs> so. 
I just think that would be funny. Oh, and if you could just keep an eye out on the crap that's being posted on the Internet, that would be good. I um, was over at the house yesterday, and I took some of the really nasty crap off of there. Yeah. Like the really hateful, I mean. Like I'm going like, to burn in hell forever kind of thing? Yeah, those are the ones I took off. Yeah, and like I'm a crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of them weren't nice, but some of them I left on. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Mom's like, I have no chance at an insanity plea. They've done all kinds of psychic evaluations, and I'm totally normal up here. Did Dad tell you that somebody's deleting all the good comments on there? And putting up bad ones? How are you combating that? We can delete them all if you want, but... Yeah. Why is there a question on that? Well, if you're not mentally stable, which a lot of people think you're not, it might help your case. Well, I've been uh, psychically evaluated. I have no chance in that. It's not going to help my case. It might. Mom, please delete those things. Okay. No, that's not good enough. I will delete them if you want. I'm going to check. How are you going to check? Because I can check. While these audio clips display the petty and ungrateful side of Jody that she tried to keep hidden from everyone else, they're still not as shocking as the calls between Jody and her grandmother. I was going to say your picture is in the paper today. Oh, is it a big picture or a little picture? It's a little picture. Oh, in, under bookings? Yeah. No, it's uh, on the front page. No way! I'm on the front page news of the CQ Daily News. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. What does it say? Well, says evidence revealed that Alexander had suffered a gunshot wound and multiple stab wounds to his body. The release states that Jody Ann Arias, 28 of Wairik, is currently in the Siskiyou County Jail awaiting extradition proceedings. Physical evidence has linked Arias to Alexander's death, and the release said that the investigation showed Arias had been in a relationship with Alexander. And that's what it says. I'm famous. I'm infamous, I should say. Jody almost sounds as though she's celebrating about being on the front page. In her mind, maybe the old cliche is true. No such thing as bad PR, as long as she's getting attention. Is it at the top or the bottom of the page? Your picture? Uh-huh. It's at the top of the page. Oh, okay. And then the uh, article continues on to the second page. Can you read me the rest of the article? That's, that's it. Oh, okay. Well, that's exciting. It's disturbing to hear Jody's excitement at the media coverage of her heinous crimes. Why would someone who is supposedly innocent be overjoyed at being labeled a murder suspect with their name and face in the paper? If Jody enjoyed the media coverage from her arrest, then she was in for a treat once her trial started. Jody's trial began in January of 2013 and was highly publicized due to the intimate and violent nature of Travis's murder. In an unprecedented move, Jody took the stand for a total of 18 days to testify in her own defense. At one point, when confronted about continually saying that she didn't remember details, Jody stated that she couldn't remember because the prosecution was making my brain scramble. The prosecution responded, The problem is not you, it's the prosecutor, right? You can't even remember what you just said. Jody's response was, I think I'm more focused on your posture, your tone, and your anger. In a reveal that would change the face of her trial, Jody once again changed her story. Much to everyone's shock, Jody disclosed that she had, in fact, murdered Travis on that fateful night in 2008. Jody alleged that Travis was incredibly emotionally and physically abusive over the course of their relationship, with his aggression towards her only growing the longer they were together. In her third and final account of the night of Travis's murder, Jody claimed she dropped his camera while taking photos of him in the shower, causing Travis to fly into a rage. He supposedly body slammed her against the bathroom tiles, telling her that a five-year-old could hold a camera better than she could. She claimed that she ran to his closet but heard him follow her, so she grabbed the gun. On the stand, she stated, I pointed it at him with both of my hands. I thought that would stop him, but he just kept running. He got like a linebacker. He got low and grabbed my waist, and as he was lunging at me, the gun went off. I didn't mean to shoot. I didn't even think I was holding the trigger. But he lunged at me and we fell really hard toward the tile wall. So at this point, I didn't even know if he'd been shot. I didn't see anything different. We were struggling, wrestling. He's a wrestler. So he's grabbing at my clothes and I got up and he's screaming angry. And after, I broke away from him. He said, kill you. Fearing for her life, Jody then said that she killed Travis in self-defense. 
This admission was unexpected and alarming, but so was the fact that just 24 hours after killing Travis, Jody was cuddled up with her new boyfriend. She explained, I just, I don't know, I felt safe right there. I figured if I don't kiss him at all, I just wanted to seem normal. Little did everyone know that even more drama was about to erupt in court. On February 25th, the prosecutor stunned the jury when he revealed that Jody had been caught allegedly sending a secret coded message to one of her friends through two magazines. While in jail, Jody had attempted to send two magazines to her friend, Ann Campbell. One magazine was an issue of Star, and the other was an issue of Digital Photo Pro. While doing a routine check on the magazines, guards discovered that a string of numbers had been written on the bottom of a page in the Star magazine. These numbers all correlated to a particular page in Digital Photo Pro, with each page containing part of the message. When put together, the message read, You f***ed up what you told my attorney the next day. Directly contradicts what I've been saying for over a year. Get down here ASAP and see me before you talk to them again, and before you testify so we can fix this. Interview is excellent. Must talk ASAP. The prosecutor accused Jody of trying to convince others to lie for her, and while Jody denied these claims, many looked at these two intercepted magazines as proof that she was being dishonest. While Jody's trial was already turning out to be filled with drama and surprising secrets, no one was ready for the horrific and disturbing allegations that were about to be revealed. On May 7, 2013, Jody was found guilty of first-degree murder. In October of the following year, during Jody's sentencing retrial, a series of disturbing letters supposedly written by Travis were shown. The letters ranged in content. In some, Travis would just detail the intimate desires he wanted to perform with Jody. However, others were far more sinister. In multiple letters, Travis apologized for his alleged physical abuse. I would cut off my right hand if it meant taking back what I did. The only other time I ever hit a girl in the face was in grade school and I was a kid. I shouldn't have hit you and I'm sorry. Let me just cut to the chase. I'm beyond ashamed about how I mishandled you and I will regret laying my hands on you and hurting you till the day I am met with the judgment. I almost destroyed a key component of your million dollar asset, your left hand. While these alleged letters were a hard pill to swallow, the jury had already heard Jody's claims about Travis's abuse. However, nothing could prepare them for what the other letters contained. One read, Please give me a chance to explain what you saw. I know it looks bad and it honestly is. I have desires I can't explain. What is worse is I've acted on those desires. I have hurt children because of urges I can't control. I worry about getting married. I worry that my wife won't suffice. I worry about having kids. What if I have to adopt? If they're not my seed, will it be too easy? I'm scared to be alone with a boy. I get unwanted thoughts and I don't want to act on them. I worry about going to the Hughes's in the future because I was getting close to that age. It would be so easy. I know you think this is sick. I am sick. I've had sex with boys and I don't know if they'll ever get over what I've done and to cast further doubt on the idea that the letters were forged was one sentence in particular that read, I want to blow my f***ing head off. You probably recall Travis's friend Sky Hughes commenting on a phrase, almost identical to this one that Travis would allegedly say on a regular basis. He would always like say, I want to blow my head off, you know? If the claims within the letters were true, then it would shine a new light on Travis's character and private life. They also raised yet another question. Why would Jody wait until her retrial to reveal these damning letters? Many have pointed to that as a sign of the letters potentially having been forged, as there was immediate debate about whether or not Travis wrote the letters, or if Jody had forged them. There are definitely many more questions than answers here, but the letters appear to reveal the inner workings of a disturbed mind. The self-hatred, thoughts on taking his own life, and saying he doesn't trust himself around children may require professional training or a deeper knowledge in order to produce this sort of confessional and apology letter. During the trial, the prosecution claimed the letters couldn't be authenticated because they were copies and not originals, 
which has led many to discredit the legitimacy of the letters. Ultimately, it was never determined whether the information found within the letters was true, and it didn't help Jody escape the sentencing. She was eventually given life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. After her sentencing, Jody had some interesting words for the crowd, stating, I do remember the moment the knife went into Travis's throat and he was conscious. He was still trying to attack me. It was I who was trying to get away and not Travis, and I finally did. Jody Arias and her case have gone down in infamy, both for the severity and violence of her heinous crime and for the media circus that followed.